it's time to start. And yeah, so I will ask you to make a warm and cheerful applause for Alice and I, who will join me on stage. 4,000, you feel 4,000 people. <laughs> There's uh, one thing better than being back on stage, and that's finally trying Amore's pizza. So uh, I finally had a slice of authentic Amore's. It was amazeballs. Uh, thank you so much for coming out here. I don't know what part of the world you're in, but um, good morning, New York. Uh, I'm really glad to be back here. Um, it's a really special event today because I actually have my family here with me, my aunt, my cousins. Woo! So thank you very much, Aunt Nancy and <laughs> Paula Poo. All right, um, so what, we're gonna be, what I'm gonna be covering today is my recent vulnerability research into hacking cryptocurrency exchanges. And um, for those of you who are familiar with my work, um, and I'll, I'll get a little bit more into this, but um, prior to this, I'd hacked 55 banks in less than a week through their APIs, and before that, healthcare APIs. So I promise it's gonna be a fun-filled morning, <laughs> to say the least, all right. So just a little bit about me for those of you who have absolutely no idea who I am because you've been living under a rock for the last, no, I'm just kidding. Um, so I'm a recovering hacker of 22 years. Uh, in 1997, uh, I showed up to school and the uh, authorities were waiting for me. I was arrested at school for hacking to a government network. Um, I started hacking when I was 13 and uh, they arrested me at school. I went from you know, being the biggest nerd in high school to being the most popular kid at my school uh, at that time. Uh, the charges were effectively dropped and I went to go work for the US intelligence community in cyber warfare. And then uh, now my beautiful wife and best friend uh, and I run a family of companies. So I've started and sold multiple cybersecurity startups. I started my first company when I was 17 and I sold it to a public company when I was 20. And I sold my second successful startup to a public company when I was 27. Now, my wife and I own a group of companies called Night Group. Some of you may be familiar with some of them. For example, Night Studios. Uh, we are doing filmmaking. So our, we just got signed as a new studio with AMC Movie Theaters and they've been premiering our recent films. Um, so we're doing cybercrime genre related films uh, at Night Studios. We also have night publishing for publishing books and night events with our family over at API Days uh, in our new API Secure Conference. So um, what else can I tell you? Uh, more recent franchises that we've launched are Scorched Earth, Heat, um, Underdog Games. So what we're doing is we're weaving cybersecurity products into the story arc. So while you're binge watching these series, these franchises, you can actually go back to the office and buy the products. So we've, what we're trying to do is completely transform cybersecurity marketing because we feel like people are just tired of being advertised and marketed to now. So what we're doing is we're creating these bingeable series, Netflix style series, uh, to weave those products into that story arc to tell you a story and actually why you need the product versus what it does. So um, what else can I tell you? I'm a published author. I published the first book on hacking connected cars. Um, that actually led me to hacking law enforcement vehicles and taking a remote control of any, okay, I can say it now, I think it's okay to say it now, Ford, any Ford on the road, where I was actually able to remotely start and stop the engine as long as you knew the VIN number of any Ford on the road, uh, and uh, lock and unlock the doors, which, you know, if you get arrested, make me your first call, and I'll unlock the doors for you while you're being transported in the car. Um, so that's, that's a little just short on me. Um, I'll kind of move on to the next thing. So I want to talk about the research. So the neat thing about my research is I figured out a way how to get a company to pay for me hacking. <laughs> and that's really what this is. So Traceable sponsored this research. And so every single research that I do, they basically, I'm expensive. They, <laughs> they cover my cost to bring you the vulnerability research for free. So um, Traceable sponsored this research and uh, basically paid for my time to sit there and hack cryptocurrency exchanges. Um, one thing that I will say is there are screenshots in this PowerPoint. Um, they've been redacted to protect some of the companies because some of the financial institutions, for example, I was able to transfer money out of the account that didn't belong to me into another account and they still haven't fixed the vulnerable APIs yet. So I'm... <laughs> <laughs> promised a fun morning. 
Um, so I redacted a lot of these screenshots, um, so that's just uh, what we're gonna be going over. Okay, so a little bit about the research. Um, so again, this was hacking cryptocurrency exchanges through their mobile apps and APIs. I'm gonna talk about how I did that, but I just want you to know that I covered both sides of the communication between the mobile app and the backend APIs. So far, I've hacked 11 cryptocurrency exchanges. 11. Um, of those 11, 49 <laughs> API keys, hard-coded API keys and tokens uh, were found in those mobile apps. So what I did, and I'll explain my process here in a minute, but what I did was I downloaded those mobile apps from the store, from the app store, and then loaded them into what's called mobile security framework to reverse engineer it back to its code, and then hunted for hard-coded API keys and tokens, and was able to actually then take those keys and tokens and validate them with the third parties. Some of them, um, even third-party payment providers uh, where they were processing financial transactions through, just hard-coded into the actual app. Uh, and then taking those further into the APIs. Now, I did work with some of the financial institutions. This was not, I'm not getting up on stage and admitting to illegal activity. So for those of you who are dialing <laughs> your local FBI office, that's not what happened. Um, <laughs> I don't look in, good in orange, so please don't report me. Um, the, uh, so they did work with me. Um, I am still working with some of the FIs in fixing these. Um, unfortunately, some of the vulnerabilities, and we'll talk about them today, but some of the vulnerabilities did break some applications when they were trying to fix them. So as th there's probably developers in the audience that probably know everything about that. Um, so the total account holders that were affected by this was 123 million, 150,000. 150, so 123 million account holders total across all of the cryptocurrency exchanges. A total assets of 269 billion, 100 million assets under management across these cryptocurrency exchanges that were available to me. And again, in one of the screenshots in the report, um, and actually one of the screenshots that we'll talk about is me transferring money out of one of the accounts into my account that I had control of. The most vulnerability, the, the most common vulnerability that I found was something called BOLA, or broken object level authorization. And I'll talk to you about what exactly that is in case some of you have no idea what that is. Um, we'll talk about that today, but it was the most common vulnerability finding that I found across these cryptocurrency exchanges. And um, of those, 10 of the apps were vulnerable to what I like to call a woman in the middle attack because I'm a woman and women can be hackers too. So I don't really like to call it man in the middle attack, um, but uh, you'll hear me refer to it as widom. Okay, so this is actually a screenshot of a lot of the hard-coded keys and tokens that I found in the apps. These are real keys and tokens. A portion of them have been redacted, but you'll see some stuff in there, in this, including some for Firebase. Uh, and one of the most interesting things is several of the apps, it was so bad, we actually had to stop the test because I was finding hard-coded usernames and passwords in the app. I had n just couldn't believe that that's what I was finding. It's 2022 and developers are still hard coding usernames and passwords in these apps. Um, some of them, a lot of them were production keys for those of you who think, oh, Alyssa, they were probably keys and tokens to dev environments, to sandboxes. They were production environments. All of the keys that I'm notated in the report which will be published were all to production APIs, not sandboxes. Okay, so you're probably wondering, okay, Alyssa, what the heck is BOLA? So, for those, of those, for those of you in the audience who are developers and extremely technical, you're familiar with the concept of IDOR, Insecure Direct Object Reference. Okay, so IDOR uh, is basically also known as Broken Object Level Authorization, or BOLA. My good friend, Dr. Katie Paxton Fear, who's also an API hacker, likes to call them IDOR, I call them BOLA. But basically what BOLA is, is it's an object ID that you're finding in an API request that can be manipulated. So in my research in hacking the millions of patient records and the healthcare APIs, for example, um, an example of this would be slash patient slash a night or pa slash patient slash ID 001. And then going into that API request and manipulating it and changing it to slash patient slash 002. 
So that's basically, if that's a successful request and the API executes it, that's called a bulla. Now, the reason why I have a picture up there, and by the way, Marriott did not sponsor this research. Um, it was just a great photo. <laughs> Um, so the reason I have that up there for a car valet is this. It's the perfect analogy for Bola to me. In this analogy, if let's say for example, my wife Mel drives, oh well, let's pick on Baptiste. Baptiste drives his Lamborghini. <laughs> I don't know if he has a Lamborghini, but he's got a Lamborghini and he drives up to the Marriott and he checks his car into valet. And the valet says, oh, thank you. Uh, I don't know, I, I can never pronounce your last name, so I'm gonna say Mr. Baptiste. Okay, Mr. Baptiste, here, there you go ahead and give me your keys and I'll give you a ticket. And uh, that ticket on it says, I don't know, let's say it's 18. He's got ticket number 18. And then I pull up behind him in my Hyundai, not that there's anything wrong with Hyundai, but I pull up in a Hyundai. And I'm like, damn, I wanna, I wanna steal Baptiste's car. That Lamborghini should be mine. So I come up behind him and I check my car and, in the, and the valet gives me the ticket number 17. But I then walk away an hour later, change that seven to an eight with a Sharpie and then come back and give him the ticket with 18 as my new number and then drive away with his Lamborghini. That's a perfect example of a bola attack. A bola attack is basically I'm, I'm authenticated, I have a ticket, I'm allowed to be there. Like I've proven I'm there, but I'm not authorized to drive away with Baptiste's car. That's a bull attack. So in the case of APIs, an OAuth token authenticates me, but what's systemic across a lot of the developers that I've seen and talked to is they'll authenticate the request, but they won't authorize the request. And it's a systemic problem across multiple industries. It's what allowed me to take remote control of those Ford cars, which by the way, Ford is denying it was ever a vulnerability. Um, and, <laughs> um, and then this research as well in hacking cryptocurrency exchanges. I'm authenticated, and with these banks, I'm authenticated, but I'm not authorized to move money in and out of these bank accounts or these cryptocurrency wallets. So that's a great example of Bulla. So you're like, Alyssa, how do I become you? You're just so amazing, and hot too, but you're so amazing, I just, I wanna be you. How do I be Alyssa Knight? Well, this is, part of the way. Um, I, this is my hacking toolbox. Um, so, uh, by the way, Postman, I love you. If you're in the audience, call me. <laughs> um, so, Ubuntu Desktop uh, is my operating system of choice. It's a Linux distribution. Some of you may be thinking, why, Alyssa, you're a hacker. Why aren't you using Kali? Kali is great. There's nothing, I have nothing against Kali Linux. But the problem with Kali is it's pre-built hacker distro and has all the exploits and the tools in there for you, but I don't know what libraries and versions are on there, so I usually don't wanna run into conflicts of installing a library that conflicts with another version of the library on the system, so I like to build the system myself. So I also use Burp Suite. Um, you can go download Burp Suite for free. They have a community edition. I prefer to support uh, the company, Port Swigger, so I pay for Burp Suite Pro. I, have a, I do a lot of my stuff on a Mac M1 Ultra, the Mac Studio. Again, I use Postman, and then Midim Proxy, and then I fuzz APIs with Kite Runner and FFUF. Now, fuzzing an API is basically sending stimulus to the API in an attempt to learn more about it, right? Find what's called content discovery. Cameraman's gonna kill me, he's like, stop moving, Alyssa. I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. I move a lot. Um, so that's, that's my tech stack. That's my hacker tech stack, if you will, uh, for hacking APIs. Now, what is my methodology? So the first thing I do is I download the mobile app. If it's a mobile API, I download the mobile app. I work with the company to see if they want to give me a special version of their mobile app or I just grab it from the app store. Once I do that, I reverse it back to the source code looking for hard-coded keys and tokens that I can possibly use or hard-coded usernames and passwords. I actually found hard-coded credentials for AWS once in an app. I was shocked. 
Um, but once I'm done with that, I then insert myself into the middle of the communication. And you're like, Alyssa, what the heck is a WIDM attack? A WIDM attack is me communicating with my mobile app against the cryptocurrency exchange on the back end, and then inserting myself with a workstation in between that communication and sending certificates to both ends of the communication to what? what what's the point of that? Yeah, decrypt it, yeah, exactly. So, checking to see if you guys are awake. Um, so, <laughs> So the point is, is that in a WIDM attack, if you send certificates to both ends of the communication, you're essentially in charge of that encryption, can decrypt the session and look at what's in there in order to learn more about the API. Now, a lot of apps, what you can do is do what's called certificate pinning. But a lot of these apps, you can actually bypass certificate pinning using a tool called Frida. And Frida allows you to actually circumvent pinning and get around it and be able to still decrypt that communication and perform a WIDM attack. So um, I have a great video on that on my YouTube channel if you want to take a look at that. So what's next? Uh, the white paper will be released in Q4. It's going to have all the screenshots, it's going to have all the data, and it'll be a free download. I, I'm sure Traceable will get it and you'll have to give it your email address, but it's not bad for free. Um, the other thing is I have a show on my YouTube channel called Shadow Academy where you can watch me live every week hacking into these APIs. For less than what you spend on, a cup, on coffee per month, $4.99 a month, you can join Shadow Academy on my YouTube channel and join me every Friday at 5 o'clock and watch me hack these APIs. We install tools. We, ins we use the tools and we hack the APIs and you can learn just how to be a listenite. So that's it. Um, I typically go over, so I'm proud of myself. Um, this is my Blink QR code. If all of you want to take a picture of that, it's my Blink digital business card. It'll give you all my social media. It'll give you my cell phone number. You can stalk me if you want. Just don't show up at my house. Freaks my wife out whenever people do that. And uh, uh, contact me as well. So thank you so much. I appreciate you guys survived me. Thank you. Thank you, thank you for, for your energy. Do, do we have a, we have time for some questions? If we can have some questions in the audience. No questions, come on. Yeah. <laughs> Alicia, you're awesome, but how do we protect from you? <laughs> That's not possible, dude, I'm sorry. Um, no, I'm just kidding. Um, good question. So, what I, when in sitting down with these, these cryptocurrency exchanges, these financial institutions, that is a common question is, okay, how, how did we prevent this? How do we stop this? So first and foremost, I understand that developers need to hard code the keys and tokens in the app because the common response from developers is, Alyssa, where are we supposed to keep them if they're supposed to be in the mobile app? Use code obfuscation. So there's tools that you can buy or you know, the several out there um, that will allow you to obfuscate the code. Um, so it's not just sitting there in plain text allowing me to be able to find them. Uh, the second thing is there's a great tool, I think, called AppDome uh, that will also detect you attempting to reverse engineer an app and actually bypass certificate pinning. So um, it's not that expensive. And it actually looks for things like trying to run the app in a virtual environment. Uh, I usually use like Android Studio and attempt to bypass it with Frida. AppDome will look for things like that. The next thing is, um, so that'll prevent the WIDM attacks. Uh, the next thing is check your code for BOLA. I mean, it's, it's the most common finding that I find. Uh, those 55 banks I hacked in less than a week, they were all vulnerable to BOLA. Um, you can go download a lot of my reports and white papers that I've written and published on this topic. Um, I'm in the process of publishing a new book called Hacking APIs, um, so I talk a lot about that. Um, but BOLA is the most common finding. And so I would check for exposed object IDs in your API requests as well. Any other questions? Yeah, Vincenzo. You make me run. <laughs> yeah, um, I guess the question I have is during this period of research, how many products or company were doing everything correctly where you said, okay, this is the way it should be working. There's Ooh. nothing bad. That's a great question. Um, 
So, you know, we always typically, as vulnerability researchers, as hackers, we typically like to say, the sky is falling, everyone sucks, everyone's code sucks. Um, but, I, you know, I tend to try and not want to do that. Um, uh, there were some cryptocurrency exchanges uh, that were doing it right. Um, out of the 11 or so, whatever, that I've hacked so far, one of them, one of the cryptocurrency exchanges was doing it right. Um, and uh, the, the surprising thing, and, and I'm sur I, one of you are probably about to ask this question is, hey, Lissa, um, this, this is bad. Like, these, the, the percentages you gave us or the number of apps that you were able to hack versus them or you weren't, now one versus 11, um, these must have been small cryptocurrency exchanges. These must have been small little startups. I actually walked into this research thinking that the smaller cryptocurrency exchanges, the ones that I hadn't heard about, you know, the startups out there, less than 10 employees, were gonna be the most vulnerable. It was actually flipped. So I won't say their name, starts at the C. Um, <laughs> um, was the worst, and, they're, they're, and I can tell you that, um, I almost accidentally said the name, um, they're, they're one of the largest cryptocurrency exchanges, and it was the worst one I looked at, and um, you know the, the most work that I've done with them. So it, it's interesting. Um, you would think that it would be flip, but it, it wasn't. But yeah, one out of the 11 so far, we're doing it right. We have uh, one unknown question about like, what if APIs are secured with a proper HTTPS configuration and keys properly stored? What Wait, if? I'm sorry, repeat the question again? No, what if APIs are secured with a proper HSTS configuration and keys properly stored? What if they're doing... Because what if they're doing that? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that, sh that should be... I mean, the problem is, is when these keys and tokens are... You know, uh, and that's probably came from online, right? Yeah, that so was online. Talk to you online. Um, so it w there, there are definitely secure ways to store your keys, um, and uh, it's definitely better than just hard coding them in the app and not using any white box encryption or um, any sort of code obfuscation. Now, I do want to tell you all this. Please don't go on Twitter and say, oh, listen, I don't got on stage and said that if I white box uh, obfuscate my code, that it's gonna be secure. That's not what I'm saying. As a matter of fact, I've been able to get around obfuscation. Obfuscation is not encryption. So don't go on Twitter and say, listen, I said that. Um, you can obfuscate the code, but there's ways to get around it. It is not encryption. But if you make it harder for me, then I'm gonna move on. Hackers are inherently lazy people. I am even more <laughs> lazy. If I need to spend more than an hour on your APIs or an app because I have to get around all of these layers of an onion, you're making it harder for me and I'm just gonna move on to a softer target. Okay, so it's not about preventing me. Some of you may want to key my car when I say this, but I do not believe in prevention. And my, my clients, I work with a majority of the APA security vendors out there they're as clients, they're my clients, and they probably hate it when I say this on stage, but I do not believe in prevention. What I believe in is lowering that mean time to detection and mean time to response. If I'm persistent enough, I'm going to hack your APIs. I'm going to get to your data. It's about making it as difficult for me as possible. That's what security to me is. It's, it's I, I feel like, I've, I've been doing this for 22 years. You know how in two decades, how many vendors I've seen come and go and say, we prevent hackers. And then, you know, they end up with an advisor on their own product. But, you know, it's, it's, it's I just don't believe in prevention. I, I think it's, it's a unicorn we're trying to chase that doesn't exist. I think it's just trying to make it as hard as possible for the hacker to get in. Security should be layers of an onion. Find what it is you're trying to protect and build your security like layers of an onion around that which you're trying to protect. A question I see in the API Secure, and I will give you, is like, what, how can you have a, a human-driven, let's say, API security approach versus a machine-driven, right? You know, in the sense that, you know, there's a lot of observability solutions, you know, like the shift left, shield right aspect, you know, with tools, right? But also, what's the human aspect like? 
trainings or uh, code reviews or like how do you balance between the two or no like uh, I don't know you would just embed on tools and detecting early AI for threats and and securing stuff like how do you manage that yeah so I've, I've, I'll always be a huge proponent of shift left security shield right I do believe that we I, and I don't understand this we uh, have this mindset that we should send all employees to security awareness training, make everyone take it, including the receptionist, everyone take security awareness training. But they're developing code, and they're not sending their developers to secure code training. So let's spend all this money sending everyone to security awareness training, but even though we have that team of 10 developers writing code for us and, and, and you know, deploying these internet-facing APIs, we're not going to spend the money to send them to secure code training. And I think security needs to be baked into the product while it's being written, while the code is being written, and make sure that we're not just attempting to secure it once it's in production. I think the product needs to be made secure from the very beginning. Hey, uh, let's say these days everything is basically digitalized. Right, so all our, I don't know, health records, banking records, and so on. How do you sleep at night? How do you basically can trust all those things if you know that there is an API that can be hacked out there with your information in there? Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. So it, I'm, I'm one of those weirdos that, like, you, you're probably all thinking, Alyssa, you're this, you know, you're this hacker, you must have nothing connected, you're probably driving around in 1960, must, no. Everything is connected in our house. We just finished building our house. I, even our water softener is connected to the internet. Um, it gives me something to hack. Um, I can tweet from my refrigerator. You, for, for those of you who follow me on Twitter, you've seen you know, my tweets from my Samsung refrigerator. Um, I'm very connected. And um, I, I am able to sleep at night. Because here's the thing, I, I feel like we're, we've kind of all programmed ourselves Right, like where we get, we're no longer surprised when we get that letter in the mail from our bank saying we've issued you a new debit card because of a compromise. At first, maybe 15, 20 years ago, we were like, God damn it, another, you know, oh, I got to change all my. Now it's just like, oh, okay, yeah, give me my new card. All right, let's cut the other. One. We're we're used to it, right? We're used to our our PII and our finance, all, all of this stuff getting compromised. You know, um, we had the major breach that was just announced just last week. So, you know, I feel like we're, we're becoming sort of desensitized to this. And I'm, I, I feel like I'm kind of at that place now where it's like, it's gonna, it's no longer about if we're gonna get hacked, it's when. And so for me as an API hacker, as a hacker in general, I know that this stuff is gonna get hacked. It's just. Can I put the detection capabilities, observability, the detection capabilities in place to be able to catch it fast, as fast as possible? This whole thing about like the APT group was on our network for six to eight months on average, that sucks, that's not acceptable. But you know, trying to, to actually bring down that dwell time is where I think we all need to be focused. And there's some people that will disagree with me. Um, I'm sure my, like I said, I'm sure my clients hate it when I say that, but I just feel like, you know, they, I think that's why also uh, they respect the fact that I'm going to just say what I feel and it's not going to be what I, what, you know, my clients want me to say to all of you. Um, they know I'm going to be authentic and when I'm on stage, I'm, on, I'm authentic. Um, I don't believe in prevention. I just don't think it's a thing. Um, Anything made by humans, ladies and gentlemen, and everyone in, in between, anything made by humans can be broken by humans. And I, I like to end my presentations with this quote from Anonymous. If I were to advise a rogue nation state on how to take down the United States, I would tell them to start with the APIs first. APIs are the plumbing of everything in our life today. Everything. You think you're impervious to being hacked because you're not driving around in a Tesla? Think again. Any car made after 2001 is connected and communicates over GSM. GSM OnStar was the first connectivity for cars in 2001. Now, that's the thing. It's like, it's the plumbing for our financial infrastructure. Our entire financial system communicates over APIs. It's, it's our world today. 
And if you know how to hack APIs, you're stronger than any biggest country's military. Okay, okay. I, I was not here. You were not here. Nobody was here. <laughs> Black man is going to come along and no, Melissa no. was this, never this here. This never happened, right? Um, no, no, yeah. Thank you for the warning. So um, we have time for one last question. Uh, uh, three, uh, three came up. So maybe we can do just, you, you ask the three questions and you try to sum up. Let's <laughs> So you're making sound like hacking should be ethical. Now, how do you suggest that it becomes more of an open source so people, anyone and everyone can just go in and look, the, look at what are the issues and try to solve it? Yeah, I mean, I, I think, uh, you know, uh, how, do we, how do we make ourselves more um, uh, able to defend off and save off attacks, I think, is continuing to hack our own stuff, right? Bringing in ethical hackers, being able to hack our own code. And I, I do believe, I am, I am really glad that the 1987 Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, I think it was called, um, was recently updated to where it doesn't criminalize all hacking, that, you know, it's, it's with the intent of, you know, some sort of malicious activity, uh, paving the way, I think, in, in lawmakers understanding that there's such thing as white hats and black hats. And I think, you know, trying to take the approach that all hackers are bad, you know, um, is the, obviously the wrong thing. And I think it's what's put us where we are today. I'm a huge, huge supporter of those bounty platforms like HackerOne, BugCrowd. I'm a huge proponent of those. As a matter of fact, um, you know, when, when I do want to actually hack APIs that are outside the purview of what our clients are paying us for, I'll go on those bug bounty platforms and make sure that they have a bounty program and then go after their APIs. Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's crazy. People don't, you guys don't understand. So, I, I can't talk much about this, but a, a senior official within law enforcement was actually the one who approached me about the law enforcement vehicle hack, for those of you who saw it on my YouTube channel. Um, there's a video of a bunch of um, uh, FBI and police cars in front of me, and with my laptop, you can see me turning them on remotely and locking, unlocking the doors and stopping the engines. And it was actually law enforcement that approached me. So, without going into too much detail, um, cartels were hacking into the vehicles and finding out where the vehicles were parking at night so they could find where they lived to kill their families. And so this is, this is the world that we live in today. You know, I, I don't, again, I don't like to say the sky is falling, but this is how serious this is. We now live in an age where I can affect human life and safety with my laptop from the comfort of my home and my living room. Well, is why get on a plane and kill myself along with everyone else by flying into the building when I can do it from my laptop in my living room? Everything's connected, and guess what? Those things that are connected, they're not communicating with Apache and IIS web servers. They're communicating with APIs. And if you control the APIs that they're communicating with, you control the device. We have two last questions, but if you can have two short answers, I know it's hard. <laughs> okay, so I, I agree with your advice about making it more difficult, basically reducing the ROI to hack a system with obfuscation and so forth. But let's say worst case scenario, I'm going to modify the bytecode of the app to disable the tampering check. I'm going to insert code that dumps the decrypted keys when they're in memory and so forth. So the worst case scenario like that, what advice would you have for securing that, that API, given that I have to put credentials in the uh, front end app? Okay, so just so I understand the question, the, co the keys were originally uh, encrypted or encoded, and they've been decrypted. They're now in memory, allowing you to be able to carve them out of memory so they're no longer secured, right? So I, from my perspective, that's the layers of onion of security, right? So it's preventing that initial beachhead or foothold on that system. If I can't get a foothold on that system, there's no way I can carve those out of memory, and that's a good point. Everyone, for those of you who are not aware, 
It doesn't matter how well you try and secure your keys. At some point, it has to be decrypted. At some point, it goes into volatile memory. And what he's asking is, hey, what do you do at that point? And so, you know, that's the layers of, uh, the whole castle and moat thing, you need to throw that out of your mind. The castle has completely left the moat. I believe the, the con this concept is dead. So, you know, what you need to do is have different layers of security uh, and making sure that if one of those layers fail, that you have another layer to protect as a backup. Hey, Alyssa. Um, in, uh, in all your experience hacking, have you noticed any difference between mobile apps and browser-based apps? Um, is that Skip? Skip. God damn, hi, man, how you doing? I'm sorry, I, I love this guy, I've known him for a long time. I'm sorry, okay, so I'm like, while you're asking the question, my brain turned, I'm like, God, is that Skip? Um, so get, ask the question again, so depending on... Browser versus mobile apps, security, right? Browser-based APIs? Oh, damn. Um, okay, so great question. I love this question. I'm glad Skip asked it. Um, so here's the thing. Um, I like to play more with mobile APIs because it gives me more of an attack surface to go after. I love, because I can always count on developers to be Okay, I'm not gonna say that here because there's probably developers in the audience. Um, I can always count on developers to give me some gifts and some Easter eggs, some presents in that code. Um, I feel like there's more there. However, um, and as a matter of fact, and for those of you who have not read it, there's a great report out there, several reports I did with Approve, um, uh, with this research on the M Health and Fire APIs, playing with Fire, great report, by the way, go check it out, um, where we went after web APIs. Now. Burp Suite, there's this really cool functionality where Burp Suite actually packages the Chromium web browser with it, and you just hit a button, and it will load the web browser for you, again, for you lazy hackers like me, and it sends all of your traffic that goes through that web browser to Burp Suite, allowing you to go into the HP proxy and send it to repeater, and then modify it, and then resend it to the API. And it, it just, it saves a hell of a lot of time. Um, I think the answer to your question, uh, Skip, is going to be mobile APIs. I just, I love deploying, because I feel like there's so much more of an attack service there. With web APIs, you don't, you're not putting a client on the person's cell phone. You're not putting it on their tablet. You're, you, you've got this additional attack surface that's outside of your purview. And with, with web APIs, you don't have to do that, right? So there's less of an attack surface for you to have to Think about, right? Military, it's one less beachhead you have to secure. Are we good? Thank you very much, Elisa. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Thank Thanks. you very much. <laughs> it's Thank good you. to see you. Thank you.